Let us begin Part 2 of Module 2 of the Alterations of the Endocrine System. Thyroiditis can be acute, subacute, or chronic. Acute phase of thyroiditis is due to a bacterial invasion. Some of the clinical manifestations are pain, neck tenderness, malaise, fever, and dysphagia, and they will need antibiotic therapy. Subacute is generally due to a viral infection after a cold or an upper respiratory infection. Clinical manifestations are fever, chills, dysphagia, muscle and joint pain, a hard thyroid and enlarged on palpation, and then they could have hyper or hypothyroidism uh, that can develop. Chronic thyroiditis is also referred to as Hashimoto's disease. It is an autoimmune disorder triggered by bacterial or viral infections. Women are more likely than men to potentially be affected. There is thyroid tissue destruction. The TSH secretion is increased and serum thyroid hormone levels are low. Clinical manifestations are dysphagia and painless enlargement of the gland. Diagnosis can be done through a needle biopsy of the gland and circulating antithyroid antibodies. TSH and RAIU will determine the various of the disease stage. Treatment would include thyroid hormone to suppress the TSH secretion, or the patient may potentially need a thyroidectomy. Thyroid cancer is usually noted as a painless lump on the lower front of the neck below the larynx. Um, you will perform palpation and auscultation, noting the size, symmetry, general shape. You will go from a posterior approach and an anterior approach. About 11,000 U.S. Uh, new cases of thyroid cancer develop each year. Females are more likely to have thyroid nodules. And then it occurs in any age group, but it's more common after the age of 30. A nodule on the thyroid typically does not cause symptoms. There are four types. There's the papillary and mixed papillary follicular. That's about 75%. Then there's just follicular. That's 15%. The medullary, that's 7%. And the anaplastic, and that uh, constitutes for about 3%. Prognosis is that most thyroid cancers are very curable. Papillary and follicular are the most curable in young patients, about approximately 95% cure rate if it's treated appropriately. The medullary and anaplastic are very poor prognosis for cure. About 95% of the thyroid lumps are not cancerous. So some of the causes of thyroid cancer can be external radiation to the head and the neck. Um, the patient could have a genetic predisposition. And in regards to gender, even though women are more likely to have thyroid nodules, a lump in a man's neck is more likely to actually be cancerous. The clinical manifestations that will be displayed in patients are a painless lump on the thyroid gland and it's noted on a routine physical examination. Dysphagia, uh, the lump is noted when swallowing or pressure, when they'll have pressure when they're swallowing and or they may have hoarseness or even neck pain when they're speaking. Diagnostics will include blood studies, an ultrasonography, and a fine needle biopsy. Treatment will include a thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine treatment, and they will have to take a lifetime of medication. Um, Follow-up monitoring includes ultrasonography, radioiodine body scans, blood tests, uh, checking the thyroglobulin. Um, it's usually produced by normal and cancerous thyroid cells and you want to keep that at low levels. Okay, let's discuss goiter. We're going to discuss the non-toxic goiter. So what is a non-toxic goiter to be exact? 
Non-toxic goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid which is not associated with the overproduction of thyroid hormone or malignancy. Goiters that are found in areas with low iodine diet are referred to as endemic goiter. Endemic goiters are usually common in the Central Asia and Central Africa. Treatment will involve radioactive iodine and thyroidectomy. So what is a thyroidectomy? A thyroidectomy is a surgical removal of a thyroid gland. It is possible to just receive a lobectomy, which is subtotal or total uh, thyroidectomy. It's rarely done except in cancer or large tumors or goiters. After a thyroidectomy, the nurse will monitor for hemorrhage beneath the neck wound the patient is at potential risk for thyroid storm. There is potential for entry to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Thyroidectomy may lead to hypoparathyroidism. And the nurse will also monitor for wound infection. Okay, so for pre-op considerations, the nurse is going to teach the patients that one week before surgery, they need to stop taking any aspirin or blood thinners. They will also have to have an administering of iodine to reduce the size of the goiter prior to surgery. And you want to teach them to avoid the strain on the suture line by bracing the head with the hands post-op uh, while they're moving around. Other post-op considerations are to keep the head of the bed elevated at least to a semi fowlers You will monitor vital signs frequently. You want to make sure there is a tray, tray and suction at the bedside. The patient will experience hoarseness and difficulty swallowing. You need to let them know that this is normal. You will be assessing for muscle cramps, twitching, seizures, and tetany. Parathyroid disorders are related to either a hyperfunction or a hypofunction. Hyperfunction is referred as hyperparathyroidism. And the hypofunction of the parathyroid is referred to as the hypoparathyroidism. Hyperparathyroidism equals hypercalcemia. This is an oversecretion of parathyroid hormone. There is excessive amounts of calcium uh, that leave the bone and enter into the blood. It is excreted in the urine by the kidneys. About 80% are responsible due to adenomas. 20% responsible is due to hyperplasia. Clinical manifestations associated with hyperparathyroidism can be fatigue, muscle weakness, kidney stones, pyelonephritis, anorexia, nausea and or vomiting, polyuria, or bone joint pain. Diagnostics include checking the serum calcium, the serum phosphorus will be low, there will be increased amounts of calcium in urine, bone demineralization will show up on an x-ray, and there will be increased PTH on an assay. The treatment will include surgical resection of parathyroid with post-op care similar to the thyroidectomy. You want to protect from accidents related to bone demineralization. They will have a low calcium diet. You want to encourage them to increase their fluid. You want to watch for hematuria and flank pain. You want to provide PRN analgesics, such as other medications that could be given are diadronal, and then you want to keep their calcium gluconate on hand. Um, you also want to monitor for signs and symptoms of low serum calcium. Hypoparathyroidism equals hypocalcemia. There is an undersecretion of parathyroid hormone. It's very rare and usually due to removal or damage during thyroid surgery. Hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia will occur. Symptoms can range from quite mild 
to more severe forms of muscle cramps leading all the way to tetany and convulsions. Clinical manifestations the nurse will monitor for are lethargy, muscle spasms, visual disturbances, tingling in the hands and feet, hyperactive reflexes, and you will check for a positive Trousseau's and Shavasic sign. Diagnostics will include uh, testing the serum calcium. They will note an increase in bone density possibly a low PTH assay, and there will be increased serum phosphorus. For emergency treatment, you need IV calcium gluconate. Chronic hypoparathyroidism leads to needing calcium replacement regards to diet, PO medications, vitamin D, calcitrol replacement of the PTH. You may need a trach tray at bedside. You want to provide quiet and dimly lit rooms. You want to put in seizure precautions. You want to make sure that the foods are high in calcium and low in phosphorus. You want to do frequent checks of blood levels. And with treatment, you want to watch for signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. This concludes the lesson of care of patients with thyroid and parathyroid gland problems. If you have any questions related to this lesson content, contact the instructor.